In April of 1792, a young French soldier sat down to rest with his company near Strasbourg along the Rhine River. He intended to write a letter to his family, but he instead began composing a poem. And this poem would soon be turned into a song that he and his fellow soldiers would sing about their call to arms in defense of their homeland. That song, La Marseillaise, would become the French national anthem. But what does it mean to become a nation? How is that identity shaped? And when you construct the nation, who is left out? Today, we're gonna to unpack the rising nationalism of 19th century Europe, and we'll explore how that leads to Italian and German unification and influences a new wave of imperialism across the globe. Hi, everyone, I'm Todd. And I'm Katie, welcome to AP Live. We are excited to be learning with you today. Go through our purpose. So the purpose of these AP Live review sessions is to supplement your learning from throughout the year in your AP European History course. And we're gonna explore essential content in each lesson while providing assignments for you to practice for the upcoming exam. We're getting a lot of feedback from you wanting more content but you know, we have only a short window of time. And so my advice is that you're gonna to need to crack open that textbook to get right back into it. And we'll do our best to give you what's really essential. Yeah, thanks. Um, and remember those AP daily videos are available to you on AP Classroom. You don't have to be assigned them. So I know a lot of you are asking for more particular specific content pieces that we didn't cover in the other units. So please feel free to go back and look at those. Um, we're giving homework every day, and we encourage you to submit your assignments. Uh, we're selecting them, and you're going to see we're going to do that today as well. Todd's got some of the answers to the short answer questions that many of you did last night. And we're providing feedback because we want to model and show you how to do better on the actual exam. And we also want these to kind of help you feel like you're not in this alone, to get a sense of community. Um, there are students like yourself all around the country, and they're from international schools all around the country. And so we are all in this together. We've all had a really challenging year. And so we wanna focus on giving you what you need to do the best that you can do on this exam. Right. So here's our learning this week. Today's Tuesday. And you can see we're gonna talk through nationalism and new imperialism and our skill development. We're gonna start looking at the secondary source SAQ for to be really specific. So um, both, doesn't matter which type of the exam you're taking, whether it's the paper pencil or the digital, you are gonna have a secondary source SAQ. So we're gonna go through some of that today. And then your homework choice, you get an SAQ with a map to choose from or an SAQ with a secondary source. There was also some feedback from some of you saying, hey, will I get a chance to do an image, an SAQ with an image? And the answer is yes, and that was last week. And so if you need to go back and look at us, unpack that, you can look at some of the last week's videos. Tomorrow is gonna to be an important day. Somehow, Katie and I are gonna do World War I and II, and, but the big thing tomorrow is you're gonna another chance to practice that DBQ and structure the DBQ response. You know, the DBQ is like, it's a significant uh, portion of the, of the AP exam score, so that's why we're hitting it hard. And then finally on Thursday, Cold War, Contemporary Europe, and some reminders. All right, so we gave you last night Ace, one of your homeworks was a set of multiple choice. And so we're gonna kind of very quickly go through the answers. I'll go through the stimulus here with you so you can see it. And we will talk through uh, why the correct answer was correct. If you didn't do these and you wanna take a minute and go back and do this, stop the video, practice the multiple choice. It's just one set. And then you can see us unpack the right answer. So I'll read through this uh, stimulus with, we can do this together. And this is by Paul Leroy Beaulieu, and he's a French economist, and it's an essay in 1881. And if you remember, that was what we told you yesterday is the first thing you wanna do is really zone in on, focus in on what the source of the stimulus is, particularly when it's a tech stimulus, it's long like this. So the thesis that the condition of the worker has improved during the last quarter or half century does not require any more proof. What can we say about his leisure? Is the worker of today a greater slave to his work than in the past? The evidence of the facts and figures allows us to give an unequivocal reply. The working day has been reduced to a level that makes it more humane. In the recent past, for we are referring to a situation which existed only 30 or 40 years ago, 
a working day of 14 or 15 hours was not unusual, both in home-based as well as factory production. Nowadays, the duration of work is not more than 12 hours, and even that is much too long. French law has fixed it at this figure. Swiss law has reduced it to 11 hours. In England, it is down to nine and a half hours. And it is probable soon in the whole of Europe that the effective working day will be reduced to 10 hours or to 60 hours out of the 168 in a week, not through legislation, but at the request of the parties concerned. The facts that we have put together show quite clearly that all classes of nation have participated in the general progress and that the working class has particularly benefited in the triple sense of an improvement in their material well being, an increase in security, and the growth of leisure. All right, so we move away from the stimulus here, but reminding you that, of course, as you're going to see the question on the screen, you would always also be able to see the stimulus, whether you're looking at the pe pencil and paper test and it's in front of you, or whether you're doing the digital test, that stimulus will be right there for you to see. So the first question is, the changes in working hours described in the passage are best explained by which of the following developments in the late 19th century? And the right answer here is government and private reforms. So the, uh, the author describes a significant decrease in the length of the average work week for industrial laborers, citing instances from various countries. This decrease, this, this decrease took place as a result of a combination of government regulation, pressure from organized labor, and private initiatives by industrialists. So we're looking at government and private reforms was the right answer there. The second question we gave you was this. The impetus for the labor reforms described by the author are best understood in which of the following political contexts? And the answer was the increasing influence of public opinion and mass political parties. So the author describes reductions in working, er working hours. Such reductions were in part the result of public opinion, mass political parties. This is all from our course and exam description. All right, and the last one is um, the dismissal of legislation as an effective means of changing working conditions is best explained by the continued influence of which of the following in the late 19th century. And we have laissez-faire economic thought. And so we have adherents of laissez-faire economics believe that the free market should be allowed to set wages, prices, and working conditions. They believe that government intervention such as legislation setting maximum working hours would lead to distortions in the market and impose unfair costs. Although European governments in the late 19th century began to adopt more interventionist approaches to the economy, many people such as uh, Bolu uh, continued to argue for the value of laissez-faire policies. So this is what a typical multiple choice set looks like, um, giving you some answers that hopefully you went through, you eliminated ones that you knew were wrong, and you were able to reason the best choice. So before Todd gets into some great examples of the secondary source, uh, or sorry, of the uh, question, the data set question, we wanted to just give you a quick format here. The difference in the end of the AP exam, the second part of the second section, as um, from the pencil and paper version to the digital version. Reminding you that if you're taking the pencil and paper version, you're going to write an LEQ, a long essay question. And you can see on the screen, you're gonna to get to pick from three LEQs and the time periods are, are different. Question two is gonna focus on historical developments from 1450 to 1700, the beginning part of the course. Question three moves a little bit to the more of the middle section of the course, 1648 to 1914. And the last LEQ that you get to pick from if you're taking that pencil and paper version uh, deals with topics from 1815 to 2001. If you are taking one of the digital administrations, you're not going to write an LEQ, but you're instead going to write two short answer questions. And one of them is going to be, which is why we practice this today, um, a data set question. And that's going to focus on developments from 1450 to 2001. And then another required uh, FAQ is going to be the secondary source text. And that is what Todd is going to get into in just a little bit in our lesson. So differences, same scoring. And then a reminder that regardless of which administration you're taking, you will write these responses in a chunk of time, the hour and 40 minutes, along with the document-based question. And that's why we have question two, because the document-based question is going to be question number one. 
Todd, did I leave anything out there that you want to? Oh, add? that's really nicely done, Katie. Thanks for doing that because there, we've getting some questions on that. Yeah. Okay, so here we go with the essay. This is the homework, and this was just a data set that I put together. And when I was looking at this, I was thinking, okay, so they have 20 minutes per SAQ. If it were me, I would put together a data set that's a little more extensive. So, and what that does is it, it you have to read it, but it also gives you lots of different ways to answer it. So here is the questions that was yesterday's homework. It is to, you. we have this number of labor strikes in selected European countries. The dates are important, 1914 to 1921. So we know 1914 to 1918 is World War I, and then these are just a few years after World War I. Um, task A is to describe a significant trend shown in the data. Task B is explain one political development that contributed to a trend in the data. And task C is explain one economic effect that resulted from a trend in the data. So there is a difference between describe and explain. Some of you were asking that in the feedback, and I'm gonna go through that next. So we can go to the next slide. Okay, so this is uh, a, a sample of task A. There you see the task, describe a significant trend shown in the data. And so I think if you build the slide, Katie, we're gonna see describe be circled here. There's a difference between describe and explain. So describe just means to tell me about, and it's a lower threshold. You don't have to explain where you go how or why or because. So we're seeing a response here from Zoe, uh, from Shadow Mountain High School in Phoenix, Arizona. They are the matadors. And in the blue, we've been encouraging you to use the T structure, which is topic, sentence, evidence, and analysis. And so in the blue, you see the topic sentence. A significant trend shown in the data is a significant increase in the amount of labor strikes following World War I. Well, that is true. That did happen. And that's a little bit of evidence as well that's packed into that one sentence. And because we're just doing describe, the analysis does not have to be that extensive. So here it is. As the war ended, economies were ruined and it was difficult for many people to get their jobs back. So we're telling you, describing the trend. It was increased because strikes increased after World War I, that's the trend. And this is why it happened. Very brief, but it's gonna earn the point for task A. So good job, Zoe, shout them out in high school. Task B, this is an explain task. If you explain, you're not only going to tell me what happened, but how or why or because. So there's a higher threshold with an explain task. So this is explain one political development that contributed to a trend in the data. This is from Guillermo from Birmingham Community Char Charter High School in Van Nuys, California. They are the home of the Patriots. So again, we see the T structure and in the blue, we have our topic sentence. Um, and I like what Guillermo has done here because we're using the stem of the prompt to respond to the prompt. One political development that contributed to Russia. He, um, Guillermo is focusing in on Russia of the data table. Russia's trend to having a high amount of labor strikes during World War I and no data after 19 is explained by Russia's shift from a monarchy to a communist society and dictatorship. Yep. Absolutely. In 1917, the Russian Revolution occurred in Russia, which caused the Russians to drop out of the war since the Civil War was more important to them, which explains why there were so many strikes even during the war, as the people of Russia believed their country needed change and viewed that more important than war. That is the evidence that we've seen in the data and is coming out of Guillermo's head. And now we're getting analysis. The people were against Tsar Nicholas II, who was unsuccessful and caused Russia to experience poor economic conditions, which eventually led to the Bolshevik Re Revolution. Vladimir Lenin hoped to create a communist society supported by the people of Russia, eventually leading them to take over the monarchy. And this explains why strikes did not happen after 1917. The people were happy with this new government. And that would be enough. But then he continues here. This evidence connects back to the claim because it shows the political development of the Russian Revolution it explains why Russia experienced labor strikes during World War I and why the revolution strikes ended. And I think I just built in there, I like what you did there with that. Um, yeah, I like what you did there. It wasn't needed, but I like when a student is saying, it's connecting back to my claim because, I mean, that's really hammering home on the, uh, the analysis, okay? And then task C, this is from Grace at North Andover High School, North Andover, Massachusetts. They are the Scarlet Knights. And again, we have an explain task. And this one, 
there were several responses here where I was like, okay, I'm not sure. And I'm going to get to that because a lot of you wanted to talk about the Great Depression. So remember the data in the table is till 1921. And the Great Depression, as we know it, um, it doesn't occur until the end of the 20s, 1929, and it really hits Europe, 1929, 1930. So because this sentence is structured around trend in the data, we really need to stick with that. So it begins, the labor strike that preceded the First World War plunged the European economy into greater debt. So we did see the labor strikes in that first year. Remember, the war starts in August, so we're seven months into the year before the war actually begins. And so you did see quite a few labor strikes early. After World War I, most European countries were in debt to one another. Germany in extreme had it owed extreme reparations to the allied powers who in turn owed money to the US. On top of this crumbling economy, the stock market crash only made things worse. So the stock market crash again, it's in this, but it's really not significant to the data, but it's not gonna mess up Grace's response. In the only, the only European countries could return to their pre-war economies was to boost production, build back up their economic infrastructure. This was made almost impossible by these labor strikes. There we go. We're back into what the trend, the data is about, the labor strikes. As people refused to work, installed the already crippled economy. Therefore, the effect of post-World War I labor strikes was a further damaged economy. There we go. Grace, that's really well done. We've got the T analysis. And we, even though we're kind of mentioning you, a lot of you want to go there, and I'm, I can see where you want to go there, but we're sticking within the structure of the question. Make sure that we're answering the question. Okay, great job. No, I think that was great. And I think reminding students to really be mindful of the time periods of the questions is a good is a good reminder because when you get off topic, it's not your evidence is not going to count because it's not going to be relevant. So I think that's great. All right, you have you have got a large topic piece here, a large content piece, Todd. All right, here we go. Nationalism and unification explain the factors that resulted in Italian unification, German unification. And so we'll go forward. That's what we'll try to hit. We'll start with Italy. And we already have Count Camillo Cavour. Sardinia's brilliant statesman, Count Camillo Benso di Cavour. He had these limited and realistic national goals. So he wants a unified Italy, but what does that look like? He's not thinking the whole peninsula. He thinks the Northern states and maybe the central uh, and we're going to just make a new kingdom of Sardinia. And it'll be expanded. It'll be awesome, right? He's not thinking the South. He's certainly not thinking the Papal States. In the 1850s, he works to consolidate Sardinia as a liberal constitutional state. So he's thinking constitutional monarchy, capable of leading Northern Italy. And he successfully builds support for Sardinia through a program of highways, railroads, civil liberties, opposition to clerical privilege, everything that's going to appeal to Northern Italy. He realized that Sardinia cannot drive Austria out of Northern Italy. Austria occupies Northern Italy. And so how do we get them out? And he can't do it by themselves, but he needs an ally. So he enters the secret agree uh, agreement with Napoleon III. And he basically has to get Austria to throw the first punch, if you will. And so he goads them into attacking. And Napoleon III, through the secret agreement, comes to the, def the defense. Austria is defeated. Um, Napoleon III backs out at the last minute, but it's going to work out because Cavour is going to return to power. He's going to gain the support by giving getting of Napoleon and France, which he needs to keep Austria in check. And he's going to give up Savoy and Nice to France. And he's going to achieve that original goal. I have the Northern Italian state and the people of Central Italy will vote to join a greatly enlarged kingdom of Sardinia under Victor Emmanuel II, Victoria Emanuele Due. So he gets it done. He feels like he's finished, but oh no, there's more. Enter Giuseppe Garibaldi in his red shirts. He is the son of a poor sailor. He believes in nationalism and republicanism, and he per personifies this idea of the romantic revolutionary. 1860, Garibaldi's guerrilla band of a thousand red shirts land in Sicily, capture the imagination of the peasantry who support them. They revolt against their landlords, they outwit the royal army, they win battles, they gain volunteers, they take Palermo, and now they're going to cross over from the island of Sicily to the mainland. So I always tell students, if you can imagine the map of Italy, which is the boot, Sicily is like the soccer ball, and they're going to, the boot is kicking and they're going to cross over. When Garibaldi and his men cross to the mainland, they prepare to attack Rome, but this is where Cavour is like, whoa, you don't want to do that because it's just not Rome, it's 
it's it's Catholicism. It's the Holy Roman Empire. It's global. And so he sends forces to occupy the pa- most of the papal states, but not Rome, and to intercept Garibaldi, where they have a discussion, and they are going to organize a plebiscite, which is a vote to say, okay, the territories we've conquered, will you just join us as you are into the kingdom of Sardinia? The vote is thumbs up, yes, and they go forward. And so they've kind of realized um, this, this goal of uniting Italy. Garibaldi and the king, Victor Emmanuel, ride through Naples to cheering crowds, symbolically sealing the union of north and south of monarch and nation state, but without the papal states. So the, they have a new parliamentary mon- monarchy under Victor Emmanuel II. It's neither radical nor democratic. <laughs> it's politically unified, but it doesn't do anything really for the people. And we think Garibaldi certainly knew that. Um, the North is very industrial in Italy. The South is very agrarian, similar to what the U.S. is like at that same period of time. Okay, next one. Next we have, let's, so we've unified Italy just like that. Didn't take too long. Here we go. German unification. And we have this, uh, I like this younger portrait of Bismarck. So many of the portraits we have, you know, he's older, he's a little frumpier looking, and he's got one of those weird hats with the point on top. So now he looks more like a a statesman, which I think he he really was. Wilhelm I inherits the Prussian throne in 1861, and he wants to reestablish Prussia's power. And he's going to do that by really building up the army make the army bigger, modernize the weapons, it's industrial revolution, we can do this. Germany industrializes and we have the middle class liberal party also growing at the same time and they don't like the conservative influence of the army and that Junker class which leads the army. Both of them are opposing reforms of the king and it's a deadlock because Wilhelm really wants to build up this army and get going but the party controlling the purse strings and parliament are saying no, we're not not so much. We're not going to do that. So Wilhelm says, you know what? I know a guy and I'm going to bring in Otto von Bismarck. And Bismarck is made prime minister in 1862. And he comes into the position with a lot of diplomatic experience. That's why I like this image, because he is a statesman. He's really, really smart. And he declares that Wilhelm's government will rule without your consent. And I will raise taxes and I won't ask. I'll just go and I'll get the bureaucracy to, to collect the taxes. And so that's what he does. And he uses the expression... Eisen and Blut, iron and blood, to describe how the great moments in history are decided through conflict and warfare, not through talking about it. So his phrase was meant to assert that wars made major events of history, and he was going to deliver. And he says, you can start to increase defense spending, and we'll, you can do it with us or against us. And Parliament says, no. But Bismarck says, fine, I'll, I control the bureaucracy as, as the as the prime minister, and I will order them to do this. So the budget hadn't been approved, but he reorganizes the army, wages three separate wars to unify Germany, just like that. Up into the north, he gets the north going. Then he goes and picks a fight with, he picks a fight with Austria, the Austro-Prussian War. Uh, So yeah, so this is the Danish kingdom successful against Denmark. That was against Schleswig-Holstein. I just like saying that for some reason. And then we have the war against Austria, the Prussian-Austrian Wars. 1866, and it really demonstrates how far behind Austria is in their modernization. And then he's going to pick a fight with France. And one thing he's worried about is the southern part of Germany is very Catholic, and he really wants to unite that, but he really needs to do it in a deceptive way to make France look like the aggressor. So the southern Catholic German states would go, hey, we don't like how you're, how you're behaving, France. We don't like this aggression. Bismarck swoops in, um, and I'm speaking figuratively, obviously, and by 1870, he manipulates this war against France, defeats the French in the Franco-Prussian War, takes the French provinces of Alsace and Lorraine, and 1870, the 71, it is the German Empire, it's declared, Wilhelm I is the Kaiser. But how about this image? So <laughs> it foreshadows what's coming later, because of all the places that France holds dear to its nationalism and its heart and its identity, Versailles is one of those places. And so they're going to make France sign the peace agreement in Versailles, and they're going to be on top of the dais, as you see. I mean, it really is like rubbing salt in the open wound, but the French, they will not forget for sure. No. 
and maybe we can get to that tomorrow when we yeah, I think we will <laughs> do book world wars in a few minutes so um, moving on in the 19th century we're going to talk just about a small piece of new imperialism the new imperialism in Africa and the motivations that led the Europeans to do this and we're not going to get to all of the content again but there are AP daily videos if you want to do a little bit more so to contextualize you can see this map and this map has um, I think all of you have probably in class seen how the map of European possessions changes very quickly um, during this time period to very little European uh, colonization where almost the entire continent is, is colonized. So economic motivations absolutely play a role and we're gonna kind of bring this up again tomorrow in your homework uh, that we're going to try to expand political empires, especially for the British empire. Um, that was losing its early economic lead, facing competition in foreign markets. Each leading European power saw colonies as crucial to their national security, as well as their military power. And then, for example, the safeguarding of the Suez Canal played an important role in the British occupation of Egypt. Uh, many people were also convinced, because of ideologies that we have going on during this time, that colonies are essential for great nations. We see this attitude reflecting the increasing aggressiveness of European nationalism and these ideas of social Darwinism. And there's a whole AP daily video on social Darwinism and its impact and how it really fosters this brutal competition among races that we see particularly in Africa. Um, another factor that allows imperialism to happen has to do with technology. We've got technology and military superiority. We've got the Maxim gun that helps subjugate native peoples. Um, we have quinine and that's what the, the image is showing because quinine is discovered to uh, help with malaria. And of course, the invention of the steamship and the telegraph, these transportation and communication uh, technologies that's going to allow people to get into the interior of Africa in a way that they had not been able to do before. Um, conservative political leaders manipulated colonial issues in order to divert attention from the class struggle and create a sense of unity. And imperialists also developed arguments to satisfy their consciousness and answer critics. So this big favorite idea was this idea of a civilizing mission that somehow white Europeans were obligated to civilize more primitive non-white people. So these are arguments that are developed um, as Europeans are heading into Africa. Uh, we're gonna continue to see that expansion. And by the time we get to World War I, this map is pretty much totally full. And this is after the Berlin Conference. Uh, imperialism begins with the International Congo Association in 1878 by Leopold II of Belgium. He forms a financial syndicate and establishes his personal control. He sends the great explorer, Henry Stanley into the Congo to establish trading stations and to sign very unfair treaties with African chiefs, um, chiefs who are signing away whole villages and they have no idea what they're signing. Um, after Leopold's intrusion into the Congo, tensions mount among European nations and industrialized countries want a share of all these resources of natural resources that are in um, Africa. And to keep peace during this time, Bismarck, who, you know, Todd, I'd never seen that picture of Bismarck before. I think I've only seen those like older iconic images of him with the, the hat you mentioned. Um, and he was certainly a statesman. And so he arranges the Berlin Conference during this time period, this scramble where everyone's trying to get a piece when there's a finite amount. And um, the conference recognizes Leopold's rule over the Congo Free State. And they agreed to work to stop the slave trade in Africa, which is really a facade and European powers then push into the interior of Africa so that no single power would be able to claim the continent. And as we continue on, the British definitely are gonna possess the largest empire in the world at this time. Uh, they, that includes Egypt and South Africa and the completion of the Suez Canal in, 16, in 1869, made Egypt vitally important to the British because it shortened that route to India. They didn't have to go all the way around. And to protect Egypt, Britain also advanced in the, to the Sudan. France has territory here as well. It's gonna solidify its claims on West Africa. It's gonna acquire, acquire portions of North Africa, which has vital resources like iron, iron ore and petroleum. And by 1882, France will be in full control of Algeria and take over Tunisia. 
to prevent both from falling into Italian hands. So we've got competition here, right? Imperialism is definitely this form of competition. Um, Bismarck had little interest in colonies, but he pursued an imperial policy to improve Germany's diplomatic position, right? See always the, state, the statesman. Uh, Germany had acquired territory in Central Africa where it established a mining industry. And it also blocked, and you can see our image here, it blocked Great Britain's hopes of creating a railroad from Cape Town to Cairo. And you can see uh, Cecil Rhodes there uh, with his sort of striding that territory that, that he stopped from being all British there in that image. So again, a, a lot of quick stuff on imperialism, not touching on, on outside of Africa and there's Asian pieces that you can absolutely go and, and watch those AP daily videos. All right, Todd's gonna get into some stuff with secondary sources. We haven't done that yet in these last two weeks. Yeah, so I just wanted to point out from this, the course and exam description, uh, the two skills that are kind of addressing secondary sources. One is sourcing and situation where you analyze sources and situations of primary and or secondary sources. So this is sourcing, which we have been talking about, um, how you go and make the source happy. That's what we've been saying, the historical situation, the audience, the purpose point of view, and why is that significant? And then the next one are claims and evidence in sources. So you're analyzing arguments in primary and secondary sources. And this skill three is gonna be what you're doing today for this secondary source SAQ, okay? Where you are identifying the evidence in a source to support an argument. Uh, we won't be doing comparison of two arguments, but you could get that on the exam where they give you two secondary sources, two historians making different claims about a piece of history. And we're looking at 3B there, where it says, identify the evidence used in a source to support an argument. So, if this task is going to be set up where you have describe and explain, explain, or it could be describe, describe. Again, describe is to just tell us what you're seeing. And so one thing that might be happening too, when you get that 20 minute SAQ for a secondary source is you're probably going to get a longer source because you have 20 minutes. But the tasks are going to be pretty similar where they're asking you to describe something, explain something, and explain something. But it could be when the author is saying this, um, what is something that supports what the author is saying? And it could be explain how there could be a piece of evidence that undermines what the author is saying. And so you're looking, yes, at what the author is saying in the source, but you have to have some knowledge of history to understand, okay, this is a piece of evidence that would undermine what they might be wanting to say. Okay, so I think we can go to the homework, Katie. Okay, and so yeah, I'll just add to that. And, and I, all of the recent ones have talked about supporting and undermining, and that needs to come from your historical knowledge, right? So, so what we're seeing here in the claims and evidence and sources, and we'll definitely model some really nice examples tomorrow, that we're looking at you being able to identify what the argument, what the argument is that a particular historian is making, and then know the history so that you can bring in historical facts that agree with that interpretation, but also understanding that there are going to be facts that part, that take away from that interpretation. And that's kind of a usual thing. You, Should we go third time's the charm and try? Sure. We'll try. And, and you can see there where it says, describe one prior intellectual change that influenced the events described in the passage. So this is a passage from Jean Jaurès. He's a French political uh, politician giving the history of the French Revolution. It will come back into focus, um, but he's writing well after the fact. So that's why we know it's a secondary source because the French Revolution, as you know, occurred in 1789 to 1799. So that gives us that idea where it's a secondary source. We have described something that happened before this that lead, led us into this. And I know it's blurry, so we might as well stop <laughs> and let Katie pick up. Third oh, time was okay. not the charm, but we'll, we'll move forward. Oh. And that's okay. So I don't worry if you're, if you're, everyone's going to have to write a secondary source SAQ and we're giving you an example of one that you can do for homework. And then we're going to model good answers tomorrow. So it, just because we're not walking through this, this is the, the beauty of having to do things live. It's the same kind of thing that happens in our class, like when the PowerPoint doesn't work or the ball goes and, and that's real life. So that's okay. Uh, all right, let me go back to the PowerPoint and we'll continue through talking about the homework. So we've got a couple of possibilities for you. Um, sorry, I'm just going to think. So the, the first possibility we have is a, is a SAQ that has a map source. 
Um, again, we're going to have the QR code at the end that you can access if you want to practice that. And of course, um, if you're doing the digital exam, you are absolutely going to have a map. A map may be something that comes up with as an image on the regular exam, but a map is for sure going to be one of those early SAQs that you're going to do on the digital test. And then um, you're also going to have a secondary source SAQ. So this would be a great if, if you're worried because every single one of us that's taking the exam is going to have to do a secondary source SAQ. Um, give this a try. It's a, it's a really good example of one and we'll model examples for you uh, tomorrow. All right. So here's how you access your homework. Both those QR codes are going to take you to both sources. I know I haven't separated there, but it's really in the same folder. And there's where you turn it in. And so there is a form you fill out and you'll see as you get to the bottom of the form to turn in. We really want your submissions because we, we do read through them all and we try to pick out ones that will help you learn how to get better at this. And you need to practice. So everybody needs to practice and a skill-based test. You really need to practice. So even if we're not reading yours and you've written it and practice it, you can compare it tomorrow against the ones that we happen to select. So it's good for you. All right, Todd, talk us through the last couple of days that we have here. So tomorrow, if I said somehow <laughs> Katie and I are going to do World War One and, and two, and also go through uh, the homework, so the SAQs, and then we are going to go through and again show how do we structure that DBQ response. A lot of you are writing, how do I speed up my processing and my writing? One is to have a plan. And so if you've got a plan and you know where the points are, that structure that we're going to walk you through, that will help speed up your task, okay? Using the structure we build for the... for the. All right. So I'm not know if that's Todd's internet, but I'm going to... I'm not hearing him, so I'm going to keep going. Todd, I don't know if you're hearing me, but um, so we're going to finish structuring the DBQ response. And then on that form where you can turn in your homework, please think about uh, this last day. So many of you are asking questions and we are reading them and we're trying to incorporate them into as we, our explanation of things. But please, for that last day, we're going to have time to answer questions, especially ones that come up frequently. So that's a really good place for you to put that is on that, that last form. All right, so our shout outs for today, we have several, and those are really about schools that have been submitting and then one selfish one for me. Um, so the first one is Franklin High School in Tennessee. They are the Admirals. And then we have Brandywine Heights High, High School in Pennsylvania. They're the Bullets, so go Bullets. And then my alma mater, not where I teach, but where I went to high school. Uh, we've had a few submissions from a colleague of mine, and that is Palmetto Senior High School. They are the Panthers. And so uh, thank you guys for your submissions. We are really appreciating reading them and please keep them coming and keep the questions coming. All right, Ty, are you back? Can you hear me? I can, yes. <laughs> oh, good, I was so worried. <laughs> no okay, worries. make sure you like and subscribe to us on our YouTube channel. Um, I'm Todd Beach, I'm in Apple Valley High School, or excuse me, Eastview High School in Apple Valley, Minnesota. Katie's in Coral Gables, Senior High School in Miami. And Katie, did you happen to hear about the cheese factory that exploded in France? I did not hear about the cheese factory that exploded in France. Oh my gosh, there was nothing left but debris. Debris, Katie. Debris. The cheese okay. factory. I'm, I'm a fan of debris. So, <laughs> <laughs> all right, guys, have a great night. Take care, and we will see you tomorrow. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>